All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. We have great uh, grand rounds here today. So we're going to, before we start off, we're going to have uh, Dr. Hostetter, who's going to come up here, who's going to introduce our speaker, Dr. Poe. Good afternoon. It's, a, it's a really a pleasure and an honor to uh, have Neil Poe here today. I've known Neil uh, through some work we've done together, and both for the Nephrology Society and research for a decade or more. Uh, Neil uh, grew up in Philadelphia, and he tells me that he's going back there after this to have Thanksgiving with his 91-year-old mother. He was an undergraduate at Princeton University and then went to medical school at Harvard, where he, uh, he received his MPH. He was a medical house officer at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, where he received uh, another master's degree in his MBA from the Wharton School of Business. Uh, he's had really an illustrious career, and he's been a go-to guy for many organizations, uh, uh, professional societies, as well as things that were educational development groups. Uh, prior to his present position at the University of California, San Francisco, he directed the Welch Center at the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins, where uh, and he was at that institution for a number of years. As you can see, he's now the chief of medicine at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and the Constance B. Wafsey uh, Distinguished Professor and a Vice Chair of the Department uh, at, uh, at UCSF. Uh, thank you very much for coming, Neil. We appreciate it. I think just so that we'll get this little bit over with, I'll present you with this plaque. This is, as you all know, the 16th annual uh, Jack H. Berman, MD, lecture. We had members of the Berman family who visited the last night. I think his wife is not able to be here, but uh, she sends her best wishes and apparently received the PowerPoint that you're going to assume. So, so, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you for inviting me here. I understand um, Jack Berman was a hematologist, and um, he, he, if he were here today, he would be proud to know that I found myself actually a kidney disease uh, through hematology. Um, uh, Tom mentioned that I, I went to Princeton, uh, and uh, I was a biochemistry major and molecular biology major, and um, my senior thesis was on red blood cell differentiation. And so as a young faculty member in the Department of Medicine at Johns Hopkins, uh, I saw our, our chief of hematology give a lecture about a new drug uh, that was going to revolutionize the care of kidney disease patients called erythropoietin. And I began doing research on that, and that's how I found my way, actually. Uh, into into kidney disease. Um, so I, I I thought I'd talk about one of my favorite topics. It's been a large part of what I've uh, concentrated on uh, my career, and that's using chronic kidney disease as a lens to looking at how you look at health uh, disparities, health and health care uh, disparities. It's interesting. You know, I got off the plane yesterday and. Um, my driver uh, in my car was a was a, was an African American uh, man who gave me an education about Cleveland and healthcare. Um, he had had uh, two uh, he had had end stage kidney disease and two kidney transplants, um, and he talked to me about everything about care and how he loved. UH, um, uh, and he wouldn't go any anywhere else. And he also talked to me about the issues about you know high blood pressure in the community, the trust that the community uh, has in healthcare providers, and how that influences how much whether whether people get the right care that they uh, get. Really, it was, it was truly in in. in Inspiring that I, I didn't want to drive to end because <laughs> uh, he, he taught me so much. But his his story he he developed kidney disease while he was a college. I have to be careful HIPAA um, uh, HIPAA violation. But he developed while he was uh, in college at Ohio State, um, and 
So he had lived with kidney disease for uh, a long time. So um, what I what I'm going to cover here is I'm going to I'm going to start with a case illustrating racial and ethnic disparities in kidney disease, and then um, I, I want to start off with this premise about disparities as a focal point in science and medicine, and go over some. I often find it useful because people look at disparities with different lenses to start off with some definitions and show you a framework about how I think about disparities. So I'm going to talk about why kidney disease occurs more often in minorities and why care is sometimes not what we want it to be. And, I, and since you invited me here, I think, I, I think it's because you wanted to see some glimpse of my research, so I'm going to do that. But I'm going to talk about other research, too. In fact, a lot of it done here through studies is, such as the chronic renal insufficiency uh, cohort uh, study, the uh, African American study of kidney disease, the family investigation of nephropathy and diabetes. Many of these were studies that have been done, and SPRINT, uh, uh, the uh, recent SPRINT trial. So, um, keep pushing the wrong button. Um, so, here's a patient, a 46 year old African American male who presents to the emergency room for generalized weakness, nausea, and vomiting. And, his history of present illness is that he had increasing lower extremity edema for two months. He was seen by a private physician, uh, the uh, physician of his mother. No lab work was done, but he was placed on Lasix, and his edema improved. But he had continued to have worsening weakness with a 15-pound weight loss over two months, and now not nausea and vomiting of three days duration. His past medical history was really unremarkable. Um, although he did have a family history of diabetes and uh, hypertension, and he took no medications. Um, his physical exam was chronically ill-appearing young man and no acute distress, but his vital signs were relatively uh, normal. And his physical exam was, was really unremarkable compared to his laboratory findings, uh, which showed a low uh, serum uh, bicarbonate, a huge uh, anion, serum anion gap, low calcium and high phosphorus, and uh, very uh, high creatinine. So he was admitted, seen by the nephrology service, a temporary catheter was placed, and hemodialysis uh, was started. So in this case, what it illustrates is a patient with kidney failure who presents late uh, with the disease, not no opportunity really for preparation uh, for uh, um, end-stage renal disease, an urgent initiation of hemodialysis, possibly limiting treatment options um, up front. And of course, an ethnic minority and African American, often we, we see this, I think this is seen a lot around the country. So my premise is that science on disparities, clinical care with diverse patients, um, like we have at San Francisco General Hospital, and education about this disparities enhances all of medicine and human health. And that learning about disparities allows the examination of complex interactions that contribute often unequally for different clinical problems to optimal human health. So we have the interaction of biology and genetics between clinical, environmental, and occupational factors, and, and also social and uh, behavioral uh, determinants of health. And I hope to show you how these things can interact. Um, this slide depicts the uh, racial and ethnic composition in the United States, California, and uh, the hospital that I practice at. You can see in 2016, Caucasian Americans made up 61% of the population. But by the year 2050, um, actually, Caucasians will actually be a minority, projected to be a minority. Uh, this changed in California around 2005, and in fact, ethnic minorities now make up uh, are actually the majority in California, and even more so in San Francisco. And then if you look at the hospital that I practice at, 
uh, we have a very diverse uh, population with about 30% uh, uh, Hispanic, Latino, 20% African American, 20% Asian, 25% uh, uh, Caucasian. It's a wonderful place to practice medicine, uh, often with um, interpreters, where there's 20 languages that we interpret at our hospital. So health disparities have been recognized for many years. If, actually, go back to 1984. Five, when actually I was finishing my fellowship, this report came out by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It's called the Heckler Report. And e even three decades ago, it documented in a multi-volume uh, edition that health dis there was health disparities among racial and ethnic minorities in the United States. And it said that disparities are an affront both to our ideals and to the ongoing genius of American medicine. And it served as a driving force for the quest to end health disparities and advance health equity in the United States. Some would say that we've made some progress, but we haven't made as much progress as we would want to. So disparities, what do we mean by disparities? Well, um, the dictionary says disparities is a difference or a lack of equality. But we think in healthcare, we think of a disparity as that it's, um, when we remove issues of clinical appropriateness and patient preferences, the difference that remains often due uh, to system factors or discrimination or biases that happen in health. And health, the Institute of Medicine that health, said that healthcare should be safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, and efficient, and equitable. That is, providing care that does not vary in quality because of personal characteristics such as gender, ethnicity, geographic location, or socioeconomic status. Um, so race, what do we mean by race? It's become a loaded term in society. Webster's defines it as a group of people united or classified together on the basis of common history, nationality, or geographic distribution. And the IOM, or National Academy of Medicine, <coughs> says that um, race is a construct of human variability based on perceived differences. And I'm going to say that again, perceived differences in biology, physical appearance, and behavior, not a biological reality. I think that um, Mike Bamshed's article that he wrote uh, in JAMA several years ago captured it the best because it says information about genetic group membership captured by notions of race in general is, is in general less than that obtained by making inferences of ancestry from geographic or explicit genetic data. And he showed this, uh, this uh, chart about uh, individual ancestry showing that the genetic distance actually between populations of, of people is actually less than that within populations of people. And what we now know, all you know from Ancestry.com and 23andMe, that we all are made up of ancestry from a variety of, of different uh, ethnic uh, uh, groups. So um, what does ethnicity mean? People have defined this as shared social, cultural, and historical experience stemming from common national or regional backgrounds where uh, might have distinctive beliefs or values and behaviors and have some sense of identity of belonging to a subgroup. But that interpretation may vary. In fact, um, this study done by the Pew Research Center asked, two, asked Hispanic, two-thirds of Hispanic adults said that being Hispanic <coughs> is part of not their ethnic background, but their racial uh, uh, background. Interesting how uh, people look at things in, in different ways. So we've known that there's been non-uniformity of health among racial and ethnic groups for a long time. It's been extensively documented that life expectancy at birth is, 
is less for minorities than for uh, majority Americans. The infant mortality rate is twice as high among African Americans. The death rate for many diseases is higher for minorities. And, and minorities are um, subject to many different diseases. The one I'm going to talk about is, is kidney failure. And these disparities persist even after accounting for socioeconomic status, for insurance, for lifestyle, and clinical factors. And uh, what, what's interesting, I had some colleagues um, Tom, at Hopkins, Tom Levice and uh, Daryl Gaskin, who looked at the combined cost of health inequalities and premature death in the United States. And they estimated that disparities, if they were eliminated, <laughs> would account for $1.24 trillion. I, I'd like to say that would pay for Obamacare for 10 years in this country if you just eliminated health uh, disparities. So health disparities are a drain on our economy. Um, this is a, a study, that I think a profound study, that was done by Chris Murray where he described eight Americas. And what he said in here in the abstract, it says the gap between the highest and lowest life, ex life expectancy for race county combinations in the United States is over 35 uh, years. And he divided the country into eight distinct groups, it's referred to as the eight Americas, to explore the causes of the disparities in order to inform uh, uh, interventions. Um, these are the eight Americas. They range from different ethnic groups and socioeconomic status, from being Asian all the way to being high in, in a high urban uh, black area. And I'll point out two things just to, as a contrast. In middle America, um, is this middle America? <laughs> okay. uh, the average per capita income is 24,000. Uh, and 84% of people finish, complete high school compared to southern uh, low-income rural black communities where um, the average per capita income is less than half of that and only 61% uh, per uh, uh, complete high school. Um, but if you look at the outcomes, and these are for females, and this, these, each of these lines are pretty much <coughs> correspond to these groups, the order of these groups. But you see over um, uh, almost two decades, the life expectancy at birth was much lower uh, for the, you can see these four groups at the bottom than for those at the top. Um, really uh, disparate uh, mortality experiences. And this is even more dramatic for, uh, for males. The life expectancy is less for uh, for uh, these groups at the bottom than for those groups at the top. So, we, so really, we we have a huge problem in this country. So let me turn to talking about kidney disease, um, my favorite topic. <laughs> and uh, we know that kidney dis kidney failure is up to three times greater in racial and ethnic uh, minorities. And this shows the incidence per million population of, of kidney failure. Um, uh, you can see uh, that it is about uh, two to three times higher in African Americans than in whites. And it's higher for Native Americans, for Asian Americans, and for Hispanic Americans. And it, what's really crazy is that it occurs five to six years earlier in ethnic minorities uh, than in the Caucasian population. Um, well, why is this a problem? Um, treating ESRD is costly, both personally and financially. A dialysis patient ha at age 50 to 54 has eight <coughs> years of remaining lifetime compared to 30 years in the general population and their Medicare expenditures are eight times greater uh, for their care. Their quality of life is poor unless they uh, are lucky to get a transplant, uh, which partially uh, 
correct this problem. So there is a great need to preempt illness upstream through molecular knowledge, through clinical therapeutics, and I would also say through behavioral uh, interventions. This is a uh, slide that's probably well known to many of the nephrologists in this room, but it shows the cumulative incidence of events in the African-American study of kidney disease. This was a study that compared uh, ACE inhibitors to non-ACE inhibitors, really one of the fundamental studies that showed the profound effect of, of ACE inhibitors uh, in, uh, in uh, protecting against uh, events of chronic uh, kidney disease. Um, but what's remarkable is that in the cohort study, those individuals, even in the treated group, um, if you looked over 10 years, over 50% still progressed to the end point, showing that our therapies, and the, even the therapy of ACE inhibitors is really, I would say, a halfway therapy in terms of where we need to be uh, in addressing this problem. Um, and so if you look over the last three decades in the United States, it shows that actually we may be recently making progress in the incidence rate of ESRD. Um, and this shows for different ethnic groups. Um, this is whites in the blue. Uh, this is Asians in purple and uh, Native Americans in, uh, in the green here. But this is African Americans. It still remains high among minorities, even though there's a downturn. And we did some work last year looking at the CKD prevalence, uh, uh, not just uh, er earlier stages of kidney disease that we published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, showing that prevalence may be declining uh, in recent uh, years, and as recent as 2014. Um, but although these were not significant, the rate, and this is non-Hispanic blacks in the blue, may still be uh, going uh, up. So um, we, we have more work to do. Um, well, why is this, why do African Americans, I want to get to the issue of why do African Americans have a higher uh, incidence of ESRD? Um, and this is an interesting study done by my colleague at UCSF, Carmen Peralta, who looked at decline in uh, cystatin EGFR and showed that it differs by race, that actually if you look by age, and this is, this is African Americans that in this top uh, solid line and white uh, in the uh, dashed line, that uh, with age EGFR declines, but this process starts much sooner at about uh, age 35 in, uh, in African Americans as opposed to uh, 45 in whites. Um, and so what we, what we now know actually is that the higher incidence of kidney failure among African Americans appears to be due to a faster rate of disease progression rather than if you saw those prevalence lines, they were pretty close for African Americans. Not the end stage renal disease lines, but the prevalence rates were far closer for African Americans and whites in the study that we did in the annals. So um, the issue then is why, what are the contributing factors that lead to um, minorities yeah. developing uh, kidney failure at a more rapid stage. So I, I want to explore this. And the way that I think about it is a model of susceptibility, initiation, and progression factors that contribute to the excess ESRD incidence. And I want to go through these biological, environmental, behavioral, and then quality of care uh, that we uh, provide. So bio, biology. Um, this was a study uh, done, two studies done uh, by Barry uh, Friedman and uh, Bill McClellan in the Southeast United States, and they looked among 26,000 patients who started uh, dialysis and asked the question, do you have a first or second degree relative 
who was also being treated for ESRD. And amazing, we found 22% of people in the dialysis unit had a, had a first or second degree relative. But this was far greater for African Americans than it was for whites. And they also, uh, this was repeated in the renal regard study, but not as profound, but also um, many more African Americans reported that they had a parent, sibling, or child with kidney uh, uh, failure. So raises the is issue of whether there may be uh, genetic determinants. Um, and this was a study that I uh, started years ago. I um, actually recently worked on some work with Tom from the study, the Choices for Healthy Outcomes in Caring for ESRD study. It was a national prospective cohort study uh, in dialysis units across the uh, country, and we followed people for up to uh, 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 nine years. Um, but the important part is my colleague at, at Hopkins at that time, Joe Koresh, uh had the insight in the, in the late 90s to start a specimen bank that included both serum uh, and uh, DNA that allowed us now to look at candidate genes. And uh, combining, uh, and, and so we've been able to look at a variety of issues, and here I'm going to talk about um, etiology and genetics of kidney disease. And this is one of the studies that was done in conjunction actually with folks here uh, who participated in the family investigation of nephropathy and diabetes. And what we found that is, is a gene, MYH9, this the non-muscle uh, myosin uh, 9, that it was associated with non-diabetic end-stage renal disease uh, in African um, Americans. And um, many studies since then um, have also uh, looked at MYH9, but also um, ApoL1. And this is just a list. I know you can't read them, but I just wanted to show you that many studies have now looked at this. And what we now know is that this is really ApoL1. Uh, in fact, MYH9 was in a strong linkage disequilibrium with variants in the ApoL1 gene, the gene that is a 14.5 kilobase gene on chromosome uh, 26, but it's downstream of MYH9 and codes for 398 amino acids. And it's actually the variants, uh, having two variants uh, in the gene, which gives you an increased risk for non-diabetic uh, kidney disease, thought to be inherited through selection pressures 4,000 years ago um, because those who have the mutant alleles actually are able to uh, uh, lyse the, the uh, organism that causes African sleeping sickness, uh, trypanosomiasis, uh, whereas those who have the wild type are unable uh, to, to do that. And we now know this is the structure of uh, ApoL1, the, the product of that gene. Uh, it's in the apolipoprotein family. It produces a secreted protein that's bound to circulate <coughs> HCL particles. And importantly, it's expressed in various organs in, uh, in the kidneys, in podocytes and renal tubular cells and glomerular epithelial cells. And it's involved in the autophagy uh, pathway. We still don't understand really the pathophysiology of why this uh, uh, causes kidney disease. Um, but this, I, I love this graph because it, it's striking and shows the APO allele frequency that's been done. Selective populations in Africa have been um, tested for APO01, and this shows you uh, and in high and low frequencies of these alleles mapped on top of where trypanosomiasis is uh, endemic or in white, uh, no risk. But these seem to cluster, they seem to cluster in regions of the world where there's uh, uh, a higher uh, endemic uh, uh, sleeping sickness 
And this is also the distribution of the set sequelae, the, the vector uh, for African sleeping sickness. So really uh, interesting and powerful story. And then work done even by investigators here in both ASK and uh, the CRIC studies have, have uh, shown in large populations that carrying two copies of the APOL1 risk allele uh, leads uh, to uh, uh, kidney disease compared to having zero or one copy of the Aslutin allele. And this is true regardless of your proteinuria uh, uh, stats. Um, so really profound effect that we've learned in the last uh, five to ten years about the genetic determinant among African Americans. And there are even other genes. Uh, this is uh, some uh, work that's been done on various single nucleotide polymorphisms that have been associated with EGFR decline in the, in the CRIC study. Uh, and there are many SNPs among uh, uh, blacks and even among white patients that confer risk in patients. Uh, uh, without uh, uh, diabetes, and I just I list them here. We don't understand how this happens. Um, a lot of this work needs to be uh, replicated in other studies, um, but it's leading to a better understanding of biology and cause of kidney disease. So let me turn to environmental factors. Um, so uh, this, uh, when I was in Baltimore, we did a study where we went, I was asked to design a study to look at the effects of socioeconomic status and race. And we went out and we uh, recruited patients uh, in different areas of socioeconomic status within the city of Baltimore, largely African American and white population at that time in Baltimore. And the idea is there were very few studies that had uh, high, higher socioeconomic uh, uh, status African Americans, a lower socioeconomic status uh, Caucasians. And we designed this in a way to be, uh, to have uh, equal amounts of low and high socioeconomic status among different races. And then we looked in, in this cohort uh, of about, uh, you can see about 2,000 patients, the percentage of patients with, who had CKD. And we found that lower socioeconomic status was, was associated with uh, having CKD versus higher socioeconomic status. But this was most profound for uh, African Americans, but not for whites, suggesting that there is a, a socioeconomic determinants may also uh, uh, cause kidney disease in African Americans. The APOL1 risk alleles can't account for all of it because only 10 to 15 percent of African Americans count, carry those uh, alleles. So why might this be? And I show this because this is some recent work that I, I did um, in uh, looking at environmental factors such as food insecurity. Food insecurity is the perceived ability to access nutritious and healthy foods with essential uh, nutrients. And what we found uh, is that food insecurity, if you were food insecure, uh, you were mo uh, uh, more likely to develop end-stage renal disease um, over 10 years of follow-up. This is in a national NHANES population than if you were uh, food secure. And what, what's interesting, minorities uh, are less food insecure, and that actually was true uh, in this study. And we, we actually showed that it was partially mediated by nutritional factors, including high levels of dietary uh, acid load. And I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. So. Um, what about behavioral factors? People say, is this lifestyle factors? Actually, the, in my driver yesterday, he thought a lot of it had to do with behavioral factors and why, in fact, um, uh, African Americans, he said, uh, have less trust in their health, in the healthcare system and physicians, and they don't adhere to uh, medications. This was his perception of that, and he said there were good reasons. 
now I actually have done some work on trust in in the healthcare system uh, by minority. So um, uh, this is a, a study we did several years ago looking at the relative risk of CKD in blacks versus whites. And this is a national population, NHANES 3, represented in the United States. And we showed that the relative risk was almost three times higher of kidney disease in blacks versus whites. But if you actually controlled for socioeconomic status, you could explain 12% of the risk. And then if you control for lifestyle factors, such as physical activity, body mass index, ethanol use, and smoking status, you could actually explain about a quarter, almost a quarter of the, 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 the difference, um, suggesting that, in fact, both socioeconomic status and lifestyle factors also play a role uh, in the excess incidence of, of kidney failure. Um, well, what, why might that be? Here, here's a, a thought, a thought from some work that I did on high dietary acid load and progression of ESRD. It's the same sample design that we did the uh, uh, food insecurity study where we took a national cohort in NHANES 3 and the exposure was their dietary acid load determined by 24-hour dietary recall questionnaire, and we looked over 14 years of follow-up at whether people developed uh, ESRD, and we controlled for a variety of uh, confounding uh, factors. Um, what's interesting, this is a very busy slide, but I want to I want you to hone in on this because what this shows is high net acid excretion or dietary lo acid load and low to this side, but African Americans have a much higher dietary acid load in their diets, as do Mexican Americans, as do those, these, these are at the poverty income ratio, as are those who have lower socioeconomic status and lower educational status, uh, college. Uh, versus uh, less than uh, high school uh, education. So, um, so what people eat is associated with their race and their socioeconomic status. And then we went on to show that if we looked at um, the cumulative probability of ESRD with varying levels of dietary acid load, that those in the highest group were more likely to develop ESRD uh, over eight years of follow-up. So suggesting that maybe, in fact, uh, behavioral health, and Tom knows that he's done work in working with the administration of sodium bicarbonate as well as, well as Don Wesson in smaller studies uh, <laughs> that these effects have, have been shown. Uh, in fact, Don Wesson has shown that you can do that with diet, manipulate that with diet rather than giving sodium uh, bicarbonate to people. So what about quality and adequacy of CKD care? Um, we've known, and this is some work that I also did from NHANES several years ago, that minorities in the U.S. with chronic kidney disease are more likely to have uncontrolled blood pressure. So this is the percentage of participants in NHANES with uncontrolled blood pressure. And you can see that uh, among whites uh, with, uh, without CKD and with CKD is about 50% had uncontrolled blood pressure, but this was higher for African Americans and higher for Mexican Americans. If you use a more stricter definition of blood pressure that actually is now uh, uh, supported by the recent AHA guidelines, it's even more, looks even more profound that minorities have more uh, uncontrolled uh, blood pressure. Um, so what are the opportunities to address this? These are the opportunities we really have in, in kidney disease. We can lower blood pressure, we can reduce proteinuria, we can administer uh, ACE and ARB, and we can control uh, glycemic, uh, glycemia in patients with diabetes, and we can prevent acute uh, kidney uh, injury by avoidance of nephrotoxins. This is really the armamentarium that we uh, that we have today. 
And in the sprint trial, which I'm sure many of you are uh, aware of, that it was an intensive lowering of blood pressure uh, to less than 120 versus uh, 140, so there was a lower risk of the composite outcomes of cardiovascular uh, diseases. Um, there was a slightly greater risk of serious adverse events of, of AKI. And surprisingly, there was no difference, and those with CKD at baseline, there was no difference in uh, decline. And African Americans actually were similar. And those without CKD, actually, there was a suggestion that uh, there were uh, worse, uh, worse outcomes. So maybe uh, lowering blood pressure might get us. These are the new uh, ACC and AHA guidelines released last uh, Monday have been on the headlines defining now normal blood pressure is that less than 120 over 80. So a lot of you in the audience uh, probably have now elevated or stage one or <laughs> hypertension uh, and need to do something about that. <laughs> um, whether it's lifestyle, uh, probably lifestyle factors. So we now have new terminologies for normal uh, elevated stage one and stage two, and I think we've always had a uh, hypertensive crisis. And, and they extended these guidelines to patients uh, with CKD, saying that adults with hypertension and CKD should be treated to a blood pressure goal of less than 130 over 80. And uh, in, in adults with hypertension and CKD stage three, or, or higher, or stage one and two with albuminuria, they should have treatment with an ACE inhibitor. Uh, and if uh, ACE isn't tolerated, then with an ARB. So these are what this, this committee came up with, both evidence and, uh, and, and judgment. Um, so um, if you put all this together, you go back to the study that we did, we said a 12% of the risk can be accounted for by SES, uh, socioeconomic status, another 25% by lifestyle. Actually, if you add in quality of care now, uh, diabetes, hypertension, control, and cardiovascular, you could explain, back then we could explain 30, a third of the risk. And if you put all these factors together, then you could explain half of the excess risk. So what's the rest of this? Is this APOL1 or other genes? Um, I think those are questions we need to be able to answer now. So the question is, how much does APOL1 or other genes contribute to the disparity? And so how is that, is it more important than other modifiable uh, risk factors, what we call the population attributable risk? Um, I love this study that my colleague, my colleague Morgan Grams and Joe Koresh did, um, where they looked over 25 years in the ARIC study at the average yearly EGFR slopes by race and APOL1 status. And this is the unadjusted and adjusted, so you can look at either one of these. But this, so this red uh, curve shows um, that uh, the EGFR slope is is more negative in blacks who have two variants than in blacks that have uh, one variant versus white. But what's interesting here is there's so much overlap. And in fact, not everyone who has uh, the two risk variants progresses as fast. So we have a lot to learn to understand why people who have the two mutant risk alleles, some people progress and others don't. Um, it's interesting that Sprint uh, looked at APOL1. They found that the high risk uh, uh, genotype was present in 20%. Um, and it was also positively associated with mild CKD uh, or uh, uh, urinary albumin to creatinine estimated slope and was negatively associated with EGFR. Um, but what we, what I haven't seen presented, some of you who are involved with this may know, are there actually studies that are going to come out and show 
uh, its interaction with kidney outcomes. I'm waiting uh, to see that. So, you know, are APOL1 risk variants more susceptible to known kidney injury agents? Um, you know, do APOL1 variants alter response to an environmental factor or uh, treatment? Are there second hits? Are there gene-gene interactions? And I think what we all want to know is not just to be able to tell persons. I actually, I talked to the fellow in the car. I said, do you know that there was a gene now that explains kidney? He said, no, I never heard of that. So I said, I go be tested. And I said, well, or should I have been tested years ago? I said, well, even if you were tested, we'd be able to tell you you might progress faster, but could we do anything about it? And that's the, the real thing we need to work on today. Um, I think looking at studies in racial groups is important. This is a, it's some work, a thought piece that we, uh, my colleague, Esteban Bouchard, uh, published in PLOS Medicine earlier uh, a couple years ago. And it, it shows actually the contribution of insights you can get from uh, conducting research in diverse uh, ethnic groups such as, you know, breast cancer differences in Native American ancestry at the estrogen receptor locus led to discovery of a genetic variant that was protective of, best, of breast cancer in Latinas. Um, you know, we know heart uh, failure treatment with uh, hydrolyzine or uh, isozorbide dinitrate. Um, exposures to endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals uh, affecting increased preterm uh, death, uh, birth rate in um, minorities who live in socioeconomic status. Uh, Stephen Johnson syndromes in those of Southeast and Asian or uh, East African ancestry, the kidney disease story, and then a Fabrinage, uh, Fabrinage uh, for uh, antiretroviral treatment in people who have uh, a certain ancestry. So we, we are now learning a lot about studying uh, diverse uh, population. Um, and we need to do more of that. I'm going to come back to my conclusions here. So I want to talk a little bit about the patient, the quality and adequacy of CKD downstream of developing ESRD. Several years ago in the CHOICE study we did, we looked at the timing of specialist evaluation in chronic kidney disease. When people saw a nephrologist prior to developing ESRD. Uh, and we found that over one-third of black dialysis patients received a late evaluation by a nephrologist. This is white males, 25 percent, white females, 20 percent, black females, 38 percent, and black males, like the person in our story, 45 percent. So no real opportunity, maybe due to primary care, but not being even prepared uh, for uh, dialysis. And late evaluation are associated with poor preparation. It's been shown to have lower serum albumin, lower hematocrits, less opportunity to get on anemia uh, uh, therapy, or to have uh, initiate dialysis with a fistula or have their hypertension uh, controlled. Um, so this is a problem. And, and we showed that actually late evaluation resulted in worse mortality, higher mortality rates among whites, but much more among African uh, Americans. Um, so poorly prepared patients miss the opportunities to make informed treatment choices. So like our patients had to have urgent hemodialysis, no time to think about other options such as peritoneal dialysis or even uh, uh, transplant. Um, so does choice of therapy matter? Well, um, there's been a debate on hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis. I think now most would agree that the risk of death in the first year of treatment is equivalent and that maybe hemodialysis after the peritoneal membrane may uh, decrease and its functional ability to clear solute uh, may lead to hemo being better. Um, and that more frequent dialysis at home may be better and that self-care modalities surely enhance quality of life by letting people lead more 
uh, normal lives. And we know that transplant yields better length and quality of life and less cost compared uh, to dialysis and live donor transplants are better and even preemptive transplants uh, may be uh, better. But African Americans and whites are less likely to be treated with home dialysis. They're less likely to be waitlisted and transplanted. They're less likely to receive live kidney transplant. They even have less uh, likely, less likely to have knowledge of different therapies, less knowledge of transplant prior to its dialysis initiation. They have uh, lower health literacy, and health literacy is associated with transplantation. And actually, they're, they're less knowledgeable. Studies have shown they're less knowledgeable when being evaluated for a transplant. And that when you account for knowledge, actually, those racial differences uh, evaporate. Um, so here are, is a summary of what I've tried to say in this last um, 45 minutes or so. That I showed you an African-American patient with a late presentation for care who was poorly prepared for ESID and had to have urgent initiation of hemodialysis. Treating disease at end stage is costly both personally and financially and limits access to optimal therapy. And that biologic, socioeconomic, behavioral, and clinical determinants conspire to compromise health and health care. And what we need to do is to develop and rigorously test interventions to address these determinants uh, through, in human health through um, preempt, by preempting illness through molecular knowledge, therapeutics, and behavioral interventions. And disparities research allows examinations of these complex interactions that contribute uh, to health. And we know that a growing proportion of Americans are not fully benefiting from clinical and biologic advances since racial and ethnic minorities make up 40% of the United States population. And actually, most of us are actually pretty uh, uninformed because we extrapolate our research largely from homogeneous populations to different populations with different ancestries. Um, and so ignoring diversity of the U.S. population is a misscientific opportunity to understand factors that contribute to human health. And so um, U.S. biomedical research and study populations must better reflect the country's uh, changing demographics. So thank you. Uh, oh, and of course, my premise, science on disparities, clinical care with diverse patients and education about disparities enhances all of medicine and human health. So thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions if you want. So the first question, I don't know of, I don't know of any mitochondrial abnormalities that have been associated with race status, and whether actually APOL, there may be a role of APOL1. So I just don't, I don't know that. You, others may know. I, I don't know that. Um, you said early life adversity. One of the things that's been very hard to, to study is uh, the issue of in utero exposure. And we do know that populations that are very low birth weight have less renal mass and less nephron mass at, at birth. Um, there hasn't been studied very much that I have seen studies by different ethnic groups and the role that they may, that it may contribute into that excess risk. So I think that's an open. That's actually an open question. Um, that's really early adverse life. Uh, you know, when you talk about in, in utero, um, 
there, there is work, there's uh, um, kidney disease in children study, the C-Kid study. I uh, haven't seen work coming out of there yet that has looked at, at exposures early in life and leading to progression of kidney disease. I think they're great, great questions, uh, but unfortunately, I think little answers right now. Yeah, so um, some of the studies that I've shown you have looked at insurance status, but most people look at that by socioeconomic status um, because they're, correla they're correlated. You know, whether you have insurance status may be correlated with your educational opportunity <coughs> as well as your income. So you, you have, as you look and tease these variables apart, you have to use one. You can't, they're all correlated together. Um, studies have looked at whether, uh, and I think this is interesting, uh, issues aren't that definitive of whether if you have better um, primary care, whether you're less likely to have kidney disease progression. That still is open to debate, and there's a lot of work going on right now about early intervention in kidney disease and whether we can uh, slow progression to better, better care, both primary or co-management by nephrologists and primary care physicians. So I think that's still open to debate. It, it, it seems like motherhood and apple pie, but uh, when you look, really look at the evidence, it's not there. I think, I, think, I think we're out of time just because I, I know that the, we, we lose our connection. But um, I want to thank you guys both for a really fantastic and thought-provoking presentation. And this is a topic I think really meaningful for all of us. So thanks for uh, coming east. Thank you. Thank you.